Well, this morning and for, I guess, the next two weeks, this week and next week, uh, we're going to continue sort of our detour a bit. Uh, but really, uh, as we're coming into this current season, really looking for opportunities um, to bring you more, more places in the Scriptures uh, to explore really the whole counsel of God. This week and next week, these messages are designed uh, to bring comfort uh, to you, to encourage you in the faith. Certainly not that any other passage of Scripture is less encouraging or less comforting, but when you find places in the Bible that really dial in and that is the focus and the theme, we certainly want to focus ourselves on those. And so I want to make sure that we have opportunities, especially in light of everything that's going on right now, which we'll talk about. For many people, this time of year is often very difficult, and not because they don't love the holidays, I think everybody loves the holidays, but because there are many cases where this time of year serves as a reminder of something or someone that they have lost. Add to that the fact that the Western world is currently in the throes of really a horrendous upheaval as millions of people have been impacted by illness and depression and financial loss or even relational discord. More than the tangible problems people are experiencing right now, studies I was reading this week have found that rates of depression and anxiety have skyrocketed by more than 25% worldwide, even just in 2020 alone. 2021 hasn't been much better. But the world really has no solutions. At the height of the shutdown last year, I remember seeing this a video online of a group of Hollywood celebrities singing John Lennon's Imagine. It went viral on the internet. It didn't go viral because people were happy about it. It went viral because they were angry about it. It was completely tone deaf, a bunch of privileged rich people singing to the rest of the world about how uh, you know, there was no God and no religion and we were just supposed to do something else. I don't really know what they were going for. But the question is, what do you do when people are hurting, when they're, when they're sick, when they're afraid, when they're hopeless and lost and alone? Well, certainly you don't sing them a nihilistic song about a world without God. That's what you don't do. But what do we do as Christians? How do we respond? From where does our help come? Now, you know that the Sunday school answer is Jesus, but the question is, well, do you know why? And do you know how? What do you do when trouble comes? I don't think that the last two years trouble has escaped anybody, certainly in this congregation. I've talked to so many of you, virtually all of you, some of you I'm still getting to know, but every single person, every single family has suffered some kind of affliction, some kind of trial, some kind of sickness, something. But what do you do when your friends and your family show, uh, shun you and consign you to categories of bigot or hypocrite when you're slandered by your own family? What do you do when your career and your finances are in jeopardy and you're at the risk of losing everything or maybe you have lost everything? What do you do when you get sick to the point where you can barely get out of bed for weeks or even months? That's been the reality of many people this year. What do you do when you observe your freedoms and your liberties vanishing before your eyes? Again, the secular solution is to pretend that it's not happening, to repeat some sort of self-pep talk, and affirm to ourself, I am happy, I am healthy, I am successful, I am loved. However, denying the existence of pain and difficulty is not going to make it go away. Or on the other hand, allowing yourself to become unhinged into fear and anxiety and, and falling apart at the seams, that's not going to do anything either. It only makes you feel worse. In fact, doing that, according to Jesus, will not add a single hour to your life. So how do we deal with trouble with insults, with distress, with opposition, with difficulty? Well, the answer is we seek to find our hope in the Lord. We seek, to com to, we seek our comfort in Christ. We seek to be ministered to by God's grace. And one of the best places in all of Scripture to see this is uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. So turn in your copy of Scripture with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Now, both letters that Paul has written to the Corinthians, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, they are very different from one another. If you were to read them all out kind of in one and sitting, you'd see that the themes and the tone are markedly different. Whereas Paul's first letter is very challenging and even very abrasive at times, 
2 Corinthians is more pastoral. It's, in fact, really more comforting. And he opens 2 Corinthians with a whole discourse on comfort. And usually, just as a pastor, and I I would hope you do the same, when someone is going through something very uh, difficult, when they've lost somebody, when they're sick, when they're hurting, I will oftentimes default to to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, because Paul talks about how uh, the comfort that we have received from God in Christ Jesus, we use that same comfort to comfort other people. And so God has this special connection between the comfort he gives us and the comfort we give to other people. And so there's a, there's a fellowship in suffering, there's a fellowship in comfort, there's a fellowship that we have together in the midst of trials and pain. So really that sets the tone for the entire letter. And while he is very tender in some places, he also puts up his dukes a couple times and really defends himself and defends his ministry against his opponents. And in the concluding chapters of 2 Corinthians, really chapters 10, 11, and 12, Paul is defending the validity of his own apostolic ministry. In chapter 11, he notes several markers of his ministry, and he follows that up by rehearsing many of the hardships that he has endured for the sake of the ministry. Because here's what the opponent is essentially saying. Prove that you're an apostle, Paul. Prove to us that you have the right to go and do and say the things that you're doing and saying. And Paul would respond and say, well, here's the proof. The proof is in my character, chapter 11, verses 1 through 15. There's also the proof of the testimony of my sufferings, verses 16 to 33. And then if that were not enough, he then moves into these heavenly experiences that he's had where God has actually given him direct revelation. He says, if you don't believe my ministry experience, if you don't believe my sufferings, if you don't believe my character, well, let me tell you about something else that's happened to me to confirm uh, to all of you my apostolic calling. The book of Acts records no less than six occurrences of Paul has an experience with the heavenly realm. Sometimes it's a vision. There's even a place where we think he was either transported uh, either physically or spiritually into heaven and kind of takes a tour, looks around and sees something that's pretty remarkable. And this one experience he recounts in particular here in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. So just look at the beginning of the chapter with me. I'm in 2 Corinthians 12 here. Paul is continuing the argument of his own ministry, and he says at the very beginning of chapter 12, boasting is necessary, though it is not profitable. And then he kind of moves into this revelation thing. He says, but I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know or out of the body I do not know, God knows, such a man was caught up to the third heaven. And I know such a man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, God knows, was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words which a man is not permitted to speak. On behalf of such a man, I will boast, but on my own behalf, I will not boast except in regard to my weaknesses. For if I do not wish to boast, uh, if I do wish to boast, I will not be foolish, for I will be speaking the truth. But I refrain from this so that no one will credit me with more than he sees in me or hears from me. We're going to just pause right there. Now, admittedly, this is a strange account. This is kind of a weird, and, and it's not just weird that it happens, but it's weird in the way that Paul talks about it. Uh, he's not very clear about the details here. And one of the reasons that it's strange is because we don't know if it's, he doesn't actually mention himself at all. He says, I know a man who had this experience happening. And he doesn't even know if it happened inside the body or outside the body. It's very, it's very confusing. But we know that he's talking about himself here. But he's doing, so, he's doing so in such a way that to kind of take his, the focus off of him. He doesn't walk into this room and say, well, let me tell you a story about what I went through. He says, I know a man in Christ who went to heaven. Now, it's in the body, out of the body, I don't really know. And he kind of gives the details. And once you start to realize what he's talking about, you're like, that's you, Paul. Well, yeah, it is me, but I don't want to, you know. He, he's very uh, uh, self-deprecating in a way. Now, again, we don't know if he was physically transported or had a vision. Frankly, he doesn't know either. He's confused about it. He says, whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know. He says, but God knows. God knows what I went through. However, it's what he sees that is remarkable. He says here that he was caught up into paradise. Paradise. I was trying to explain to one of my children this past couple days. We're talking about heaven and the reality of heaven. And it's not just strumming, you know, a harp sitting on a cloud. I tried to paint this picture of what paradise would look like. And their imaginations ran wild and so does mine and I'm sure so does yours. But when you think about what does paradise look like for us, 
without sin, without sickness, without pain, only glory, only excitement, only the presence of Christ and all of his majesty. And he says, I heard things that were inex inexpressible, things that I heard from God that are just too wonderful. I can't even put it into words. That was the description that Paul has of paradise, inexpressible things that he experienced. Now again, we don't know the content of the revelation. We don't know what God said, what he revealed to him, but we know that it's amazing, whatever he saw. And no sooner does Paul return from this amazing experience, this mountaintop experience in his life, where God then chastens him with a severe trial. Look at verse 7. Because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. Now, starting here and through verse 10, Paul really shifts away from the discussion about the apostolic ministry and even about his trip to heaven. He kind of stops about talking about that for just a second. And he focuses on his experience of pain and suffering. But in these short verses here, he teaches us much about God's purpose and God's promise in light of difficulty. See, Paul, he does something here in, in the course of the rhetoric, in the course of the argument. He seizes on this amazing experience, on the advent of this amazingly heavenly experience of paradise, and he seizes on that to talk about these various trials, to teach the church, to teach you and me about the goodness of God and the sufficiency of of his grace. I want to read these verses together, verses 7 through 10. This is where we're going to spend our time. Again, verse 7. Because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. Concerning this, I implored the Lord three times that it might leave me. And he has said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Now, for our purposes in this text, we're going to spend this week and next week, I want to explore these four verses together here. And I do plan on teaching some of the content. This won't be a full-on exposition, because I want to, I'll save that for when we actually go through 2 Corinthians. But I want to really use these verses and, and explain them to you and, and open them up and unpack them a little bit for the purpose of making application to us. Again, I want to comfort you with the text of Scripture and apply these to you and especially those who are going to be listening to this or watching this even uh, from their homes, I want to make application. I want us to see here four key principles that we are to learn from these verses regarding God's dealing with us in the face of trials and pain and difficulty. So four key principles. We're not going to get through all of them today. We'll do two today, two next week. But I want to look through these, and I think you're going to see these principles uh, found in the, the text itself. But number one, the first key principle that we, we're going to learn today is this. God disciplines even his most faithful servants. I want to say that again. God disciplines even his most faithful servants. There is a myth, I believe, today that if you're experiencing trials, that God is somehow angry at you. Now, sometimes that's true. Sometimes you experience earthly consequences for sins or even just for poor choices that you've made. There are natural consequences when we do something wrong. And I would say that if you're engaged in some kind of unrepentant sin, if you're in a pattern of sin, then you are to repent and turn to Christ. If God is making you miserable in your sin, then seek to, to find forgiveness in Him. The Lord is most likely using this trial in the midst of your own sin to draw you away from that sin toward Him to find forgiveness and seek rest, reconciliation with Him over that, that very issue. So certainly, if you know that you're in sin and you're being afflicted for it, stop fighting Him. Turn to Him, repent of your sin, and say, Lord, I give up. You are right. I am wrong, forgive me and help me to live a life of righteousness. 
But the main point I want to hit here is the reality of a person who is suffering or hurting, but yet they didn't do anything, at least temporally, to deserve it. I'm not talking about a, a statement about uh, sin and the theology of sin, because the Bible teaches all have sinned. None of us are innocent of sinfulness. But what I'm talking about is the existence of trials that are seemingly disconnected to some specific sin. There are times in your life where things happen to you and you didn't do anything to deserve it or to incur it. When you, are, when you get sick, it's not necessarily that God is punishing you for some sin you've committed. When your business fails or when someone hurts you, when someone just flies off the handle and hurts you, or you're in a car crash, or whatever the trial may be. The trials and the hurts and the pains aren't necessarily tied to something you've done wrong. And Jesus even deals with that in his day. I'm, I'm reminded of uh, John chapter 9. Jesus is passing by a man who was born blind, and the disciples, they asked Jesus, what did this man do? Did he sin or did his parents sin that you would, you would afflict him with blindness? And Jesus said, that's not the case at all. This man wasn't born blind because of some sin he did or some sin his family did. And then he goes on to say, he, this man was born blind so that the works of God might be displayed in him, and then Jesus heals him. So there's actually a, a marvelous reason that this man was born blind, so that Christ would walk by at that specific moment and heal him for God's glory. So we understand that the Lord blows that myth up, that your pain and your suffering and your trials are somehow distinctly connected to something you've done wrong. Again, I'm not talking about consequences for earthly decisions and earthly sins. I'm talking about just the existence of pain and suffering. There are many times that you'll experience trials in the midst of being faithful to God. And certainly that was the situation with Paul. I'll never forget, and I, I've been getting into stories lately, and I don't want to go too far with these stories. I think this one's innocuous enough, but about two months before we were about to plant the church, I went to a conference, and as I'm sitting in the parking lot, my van uh, just broke down and stopped working. And if you, any of you who know my history and know the story of this really crazy van, there's a lot more behind the story, but it's a Ford. I don't read too much into that, but um, my van broke down in the parking lot of the church I was attending before uh, going out to plant the church, and I, I just remember being so distressed. It was just the last line of a series of trials, and I just broke down. I was with my, my pastor at the time, and I just said, Lord, I don't understand. Like, why is this happening? Like, I'm, I'm planting a church for you in two months. Like, why is my van breaking down? And it was the wrong impulse. But the, the feeling was, you know, did I do something wrong to deserve my van breaking down? And I don't have money to repair this van. And the answer is, theologically, we know from the Bible, no. No, I wasn't in sin in that moment to deserve a broken van. But the Lord used that van for lots of purposes. To make me the godly, upright man I am today. And humble, by the way. No. But, the, you know, the Lord uses these things even when you're doing something for Him. That's the point I want to make. It's not always a punishment for something you've done wrong. Paul has this same experience. Paul has just gotten done. And I want you to look at the context. He has just gotten done in the previous breath talking about this amazing experience he's had in ministry. He's defending his apostolic ministry. He experiences this miraculous, marvelous, wonderful experience with God, and then boom, trial, right afterwards. But this is a common occurrence for all who serve the Lord God. After all, Job was an upright man when God allowed affliction to come to him, to chasten him. Joseph was greatly sinned against in his life. He was delivered over because of the sin of his brothers, even though it wasn't his fault. And what did Joseph say? What they had caused or meant for evil, God has used for good. He had the proper perspective about his trials. Peter went through trials and difficulty. John, Paul, all the disciples, read the course of church history. All who serve God, all who serve God are afflicted in this life. In fact, if you're not enduring trials for the sake of godliness, you're probably doing something wrong, if you will. But God, my point is that God, he afflicts all who serve him faithfully, and yet they're still faithful to him. And so it's not out of the ordinary for God to chasten those who are serving him the most. And the question is, why does he do this? It, according to the world's philosophy, that seems totally backwards. You don't discipline and punish those who are serving you, or do you? 
we get a window into this, into uh, Hebrews chapter 12. Turn to Hebrews chapter 12. Just flip a couple pages ahead in the New Testament. Hebrews 12. We have visited this passage multiple times in the last couple of years. I find that when I go to talk about something like this, I find myself uh, just jumping back to this passage because it's just so pertinent. And really, it's so rich for us. It teaches us a lot about uh, the nature of God's discipline and his chastening. And the question for us is, how does God treat us in terms of in the Christian faith? How does God treat us? And the answer is, well, he treats us like his own children. He treats us like his children. Hebrews 12, really verse 2, makes the argument that as we live as Christians, we are to consider the example of Jesus who suffered for our sake. And then the writer of Hebrews, uh, cough, cough, Paul, I think it was Paul, but whatever, that's a different topic for a different day. The writer of Hebrews, he gets into this discourse about the nature of being chastened by the Lord. Look at, pick it up in verse 3. He says, For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Pause right there. That's the temptation. That's the temptation when you experience hardship is to grow weary and to lose heart and say, I don't even know what's going on. You know what? I think I'm done. That's the temptation. To lose heart, to grow weary, to become discouraged. He says, consider this. Consider Christ. Verse 4. For you have not resisted yet to the point of shedding blood against your striving of sin. Versus what Christ has done. And you, have you forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons? And here he's quoting from the Old Testament. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are legitimate, ir- illegitimate children and not sons. That's what I said before, right? If you're not experiencing discipline, watch out. That's what he says here. If you're not experiencing discipline, then you're illegitimate children, you're not sons. Furthermore, verse 9, we have had earthly fathers to discipline us, and we respected them. Shall we not much rather be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time, as seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good, that we might share in his holiness. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet for those who have been trained by it, afterwards, afterwards, my friends, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. The key idea here is that because of your salvation in Christ, God's relationship with you changes. You are no longer enemies of the cross. You're no longer uh, uh, subjects and, and recipients of God's divine wrath. He goes from fierce judge to loving father. He adopts you as his own children. He brings you in his arms close to his heart and he seats you in the heavenly places in Christ. We are now children of God. He is now our loving Father, and when He becomes our loving Father, He begins to discipline us as our Father. Then the uh, the writer of Hebrews makes this argument that in order to grow as children, we we train them, we discipline them, right? Anybody who's had children know that you you don't just have them, feed them, and let them do whatever they want and hope that they'll just figure it out. You have to grow them and train them and discipline them and correct them and exhort them. Sometimes the punishment is very severe. Sometimes you have to do the very thing you don't want to do. Take something away from them. Make a decision that's going to impact them in what they perceive to be a negative light. You protect them from danger. You protect them from themselves. So if we as sinful parents discipline our own children, then how much more and how much more perfectly will a holy God discipline us who are His children? So our Heavenly Father, He disciplines us, He trains us, He chastens us, and sometimes, my friends, and you know this, it is very, very painful. Why? Look at verse 11. 
All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful but sorrowful. God, why are you doing this to me? Why am I in such pain? Why is this so hurtful to me? Don't you love me? Aren't you here for me? All of it seems sorrowful, not joyful. Yet those who have been trained by it, after the fact, when you look back over your life, when you look back over your trials, after the fact, afterwards, he says, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. After you've been trained by it, you look back and you say, wow, the Lord was so good to me. He was so kind to me. Now I actually have this overwhelming peace of God. Not only have I been justified by faith and adopted into His family and loved by God and been the recipient of His grace and mercy, even more than that, He's actually been really kind to me in my life. He's saved me from my own sinfulness. He's actually protected me from dangers and violent situations and toxic relationships that would otherwise destroy me. He saved me from myself. Now, we're going to get more into the reasons behind this in just a second. But the main thing I want you to see here, verse 6, God disciplines those He loves. He disciplines those He loves. And in Paul's case, the Lord disciplines even His most, most faithful servant. I mean, Paul, Paul had given up everything. Paul's identity was no longer Paul, a Jewish Pharisee, an upright man, a, a zealot, a religious leader. He, he accounted all of that to be nothing. He says, I've given up everything for, for God. I'm a doulos theo. I'm a slave of God. I'm a servant of Christ. I am not my own. I've been bought with a price. I do not belong to myself. Everything I have belongs to God. He's not married. He has no attachments. His entire existence is hyper-focused on serving the Lord God, the most faithful man in the Scriptures apart from Christ, and yet... God afflicts him. Go back to in your minds in Acts chapter 9. When Paul is saved and redeemed and he's blinded, he goes into the house of Ananias. And Ananias is questioning, Lord, you realize who you just brought to my house, right? This guy murders Christians. And the Lord responds to Ananias. And he says, this is my chosen servant. And I will show him the things that he must suffer for my namesake. Right from the very beginning of his ministry. I'm going to show him what I'm going to do to chasten him, to make him suffer for my glory and for his good. And Paul, when he looks back over his life, you read 2 Timothy, Paul is thankful. Paul loves the Lord that God would even find him faithful at all to put him into service. It's remarkable, really. Now, if you are not a Christian, if you do not belong to God, if you have never repented of your sins and trusted in Jesus Christ for salvation, my friends, it is very likely that the Lord is going to afflict you and is afflicting you so that you'll stop trusting in yourself and trust in Him instead. I, I had an old pastor, would, he would say, and he would give an evangelistic sermon. At the, at the end of his sermon, he would say things like this, and this always stuck in my mind. He would say this, if you're not a Christian, I hope the Lord makes you miserable tonight and you don't sleep. Now, from the outside, you're thinking, boy, that's kind of mean. What's the point? That the Lord would actually drive you to a place of desperation so you would get rid of your self-reliance and your trusting in your own salvation and your pride and your arrogance that you would turn away from all of that and bow the knee and trust in Him for life. It's the most loving thing to desire that someone would be, would be broken and be saved. People prayed for that for me, and I praise the Lord they did. And I would expect for you as well. And so, my friends, if you don't know Christ, if there's anyone here who does not know Christ, the Lord might be breaking you down for the purpose of bowing the knee and submitting to Him. And so I would encourage you, stop fighting Him. Don't fight Turn from your sins and trust in Jesus Christ. And the Bible says you will have eternal life. He will give you life. But for those who have been born again, who belong to God, again, we're not promised a pain-free life. It's not that if you trust in Jesus, well, all that pain's going to go away. In fact, God will probably intensify it and focus it in on your sanctification, on your growth. 
He will use it for good. But we need to get this idea out of our heads that the existence of pain and trials means that God is angry and punishing you for something you've done. Because if that's true, then the cross is meaningless. Because Jesus was punished for us as a substitute. Jesus took on all the pain and all the consequences and all the condemnation for believers. That's the beauty of the gospel. That you don't have to pay for sins eternally. Again, I'm not talking about earthly consequences. I'm talking about the pain and the sickness, and the difficulty, and the loss, even that that you experience in the midst of being faithful to God. Paul experienced the surpassing greatness and inexpressible joy of communion with God, and yet God still disciplined them with trials. Go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. So again, our first principle here. And I want you to make sure you nail this down in your minds because it's important. It's from the Bible. It is pervasive throughout all of Scripture that God will discipline even His most faithful servants. He will. He disciplines those He loves. Number two, number two key principle here. Trials are given to us to produce godly character. Trials are given to us to produce godly character. Jump into verse 7 with me. Paul again says, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. The juxtaposition between the first half of this verse and the second half of the verse is really jarring. He goes from talking about the surpassing greatness of the revelation of heaven mountaintop experience, really remarkable. He goes from that to satanic afflictions from the pit of hell. My goodness, what a shift in one sentence, right? Now in Paul's defense, he's experiencing heavenly visions and really that's enough to make anybody brag. If I saw what Paul saw, my goodness, my sinful heart would probably go, well, I know you guys didn't experience this, but let me tell you about it. And I mean, just evidence by that. Look at all the books that come out in the in print, people people have supposedly gone to heaven and experienced these things. If they actually have experienced anything by dying and going to heaven, you think God is going to permit them to talk about it afterwards? He doesn't allow Paul. Why would he allow these other people to do it? I have serious, serious doubts about those who come back from heaven and are allowed to talk about what they've seen. Frankly, I don't believe it. And more and more we hear every year about someone who comes out and actually recants and retracts a book that they've written and say, actually, I was lying. It happens all the time. Be careful, believers. Be very careful when someone comes back and tells you things that Paul says he's not even allowed to talk about. But anyway, I digress. Paul could brag about his experience. He could be bragging about what he's seen. But in truth, if Paul were to boast and brag and become arrogant, he would have been just like Satan. And so God is actually very kind to Paul. See, Satan wants him to be prideful. Satan would love for Paul to come back and and tell everybody how great he is because he experienced this heavenly revelation. Satan wants him prideful. Satan wants you and me prideful to think much of ourselves. But God wants him humble. God wants you and me to be humble, to not think highly of ourselves, to not think more of ourselves than we ought to think, to have a right view of who we really are. And so Paul says this, to keep me from exalting myself, God has chastened me. This word in the Greek is huperairo. It really means to lift oneself up, to be high-minded, really to think lofty thoughts about oneself. One translation renders this, to keep me from becoming conceited. And so that's what Paul says here. This is, this is the sin of pride. And he says to keep me from myself, from my own pride, from my own arrogance, for becoming conceited and talking about myself all the time, in order to keep me from that, he says, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, and then he qualifies, a messenger of Satan. Now, this phrase has given Bible scholars trouble throughout the course of history because it's very vague. We don't really know exactly what he's talking about, but we can, we can infer some things. He doesn't clarify what exactly this is. The word here for thorn 
Uh, scallops in the Greek refers to a stake or a spike, something very sharp, a, a piercing object. Now, he makes, it makes the most sense that Paul is referring to some kind of a physical affliction, and several commentators think he's talking about a physical affliction. I've read all kinds of uh, theories about what physical ailment this could have been, and they, they infer from different places in Scripture things he talks about. Some people think he had epilepsy or some kind of sickness or he experienced malaria maybe, uh, migraine headaches, a speech impediment, uh, even an eye disease. At one point he says, I, you know, I would have plucked out my eyes. You would have given me your eyes because you love me so much. And they're like, oh, maybe he has an eye problem we don't know. And it's hard to say. We don't really know what Paul's affliction was. It could just be he has a headache from getting stoned in the head so many times, people throwing things at him and hurting him. I mean, that could give me a headache. We don't know what the affliction is. But others have actually seen this as a spiritual thing a spiritual problem, that this thorn in the flesh, which he qualifies as a messenger of Satan, could be a demonic affliction. The Lord actually sent and allowed a, a demon to harass him, not to indwell him, but to afflict him. We think about his, his experience with the, with the Philippian church. There was a demon-possessed girl who literally followed behind him and just ran her mouth until finally he turned around one day and said, in the name of heaven, stop talking. He shut her up because this was affliction from the enemy. So it could have been a demonic affliction. It could have been an opposing enemy, a false teacher that was harassing him. It could have just been more broadly persecution. It could have been his own temptation that he was prone to do certain kinds of sins and it was afflicting him terribly. We don't know. We don't know what Paul's affliction was. And really, in many ways, that's kind of comforting for us who want to apply these verses because if Paul said it was this specific thing, it's easy for us to write it off and say, well, that's not my issue. I have a different issue. But this is so vague Really, you could put anything in here and say, yeah, the same affliction that Paul has, I have something like that. All, not all of us are afflicted in the same ways. Everybody has their own propensity to sin. You might have an issue with this, I might not, but vice versa, I'll have this issue, you don't have that issue. All of us have some kind of a thorn in the flesh, a, a, really a messenger, a, an opponent of Satan to, to attack us. Several of us, or many of you, have many of these things. A life lived on earth in the flesh as a life of affliction. So we don't know. But whatever this is, we do know that God is the one who's ordained it. God actually brings this to bear. How do we know? How do we know? Because Paul goes directly to God in verse 8 to have it removed. He knows where it's coming from. He goes to God and says, Lord, will you please remove this from me? I know you brought this for me to keep me from exalting myself. And, I, and he, I promise I'll never be prideful again. I mean, how many times have we done that? I promise I'll never do it again, Lord. But he brings this affliction, and Paul goes right to God on his face, and he's asking him to remove it. He knows where it's coming from. Again, why? Why would God ordain such satanic affliction? Why would God allow Satan to afflict his beloved servant? Paul gives the answer twice in verse 7. Twice he says this. To keep me from exalting myself. He says it twice. I know why I'm being afflicted. I know why this hurts so bad because my heart would be prideful otherwise. God afflicted Paul in order to destroy spiritual pride and produce in him godly humility. See, God hates pride. He hates pride. He hates it so much that he's going to stop at nothing to root it out in his children. And my friends, he will. If you're a person who is prone to pride, I believe all of us are prone to some kind of level of pride. I've heard it said before that there is the pride of self-promotion, to walk around and think you're so great. There's also the pride of self-pity, where you're constantly depressed and upset all the time. And the reason is, is because you're upset because people aren't praising you for what you think you deserve. And so when you become self-deprecating and when you become woe is me and saddened all the time because of all this stuff, you're, you're not receiving what you think you deserve. So all of us experience some level of pride, but God hates that. And God will root it out. He will destroy it in his people. Why? Because he loves us. In fact, we're warned of this in 1 Corinthians 10, 12. Let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. You think you're doing pretty good? You think you're okay and you find yourself getting puffed up? Happens to me all the time. When I think, I think I'm doing all right. I think I got this whole ministry thing down. I think I'm a pretty good father. I think I'm doing well in my marriage. Watch out. Be careful, right? You, I, you're, I'm seeing the looks on all your faces. You know what I'm talking about. 
As soon as you think you're doing just fine, something comes along and knocks you off your high horse. And you realize, man, I need help. I'm not as great as I thought I was. In fact, if he doesn't afflict you in the midst of your pride, be very afraid. Be very afraid. Because he might end up delivering you over to your own destruction. He will allow you to be ruined by your own sin. And I get very afraid for anyone who would experience that. God delivering you over. So I, I'm thankful when the Lord chastens and stops me dead in my tracks, and I'm thankful when he does it in your life as well. Because that means that there's an opportunity for sanctification, for growth, for repentance. But trials are designed to humble us. They're designed to make us keenly self-aware that we're broken and flawed, and only God is God. Trials keep, it, keep us from thinking too much of ourselves. They keep us from exalting ourselves and thinking so highly of us. It's pretty hard to brag when you're flat on your back in agony, isn't it? It's hard to think you're something special when you know that you're not. And when you feel it in your body, when you feel it in your heart, when you feel it in your mind, it's pretty hard to brag. Trials, my friends, trials remind us who's on the throne. And they produce in us the godly character of humility. But look at what this does to Paul. Not only humility, but this is really amazing. Look at verse 8. It forces him to pray. Verse 8. Concerning this, I implored the Lord three times that it might leave me. Now, I suspect that Paul was praying more than three times, but we see this, this theme of, of entreating the Lord multiple times. And this number three is, is symbolic in the Scriptures. The idea is that Paul is repetitive. Now, I'm not trying to argue with Paul. He says it was three times, it's three times. But don't you think for a second that when you're afflicted, you're going to be going to the Lord all the time. But here, Paul goes to the Lord at least these three times to implore the Lord. This word implore means to entreat, to call out, perikaleo. It's, it's, a, it's a serious, intentional thing. He argued with God and wrestled with God like Jacob as if he's grabbing hold of the hem of his robe and saying, Lord, please remove this from me. This messenger of Satan, remove this from me. Three times, Paul says, he did this. But not only does this humble Paul, it drives him toward dependence on God. There's another purpose here. The trials, they don't just ruin us and, and keep us humble. They also drive us to God. They motivate us to seek the Lord. They force us to look at Him because to look at yourself is too painful at that point. And so it produces prayer in us. There's, a, there's the old saying, there's no atheists in foxholes. When mortars are coming down around you and you're about to die, you start praying, don't you? I tell you, you get sick, you get hurt, your financial situation dries up, you fall to your knees and you say, I've never prayed to you before, Lord, but I'm praying now. Now, the question is, when he delivers you out, are you still going to be faithful to him? That's the old kind of deathbed conversion issue, isn't it? And so I would just in, in, entreat you that if the Lord drives you to this place of prayer and of trusting and of hope, stay there. Don't just forget about the Lord when things get good again, if they ever do. But these trials, they bring us to prayer. They bring us to faith. They bring us to hope. Where our eyes and our minds and our hearts are trained on God. Lord, will you please remove this from me? Lord, will you please heal me? Lord, will you please restore strength to my bones? Help me, Lord. Elsewhere in Romans chapter 5, Paul notes that tribulations and trials, he says, they produce in us perseverance. Perseverance, which brings about proven character and thereby hope. So God does a lot. Trials produce a leaning on the Lord. And I would even add proven character is godly character. Character that lasts, whereby your knee-jerk reaction to trials isn't to panic and melt down and get angry, but rather to stop and humble yourself and pray and wait patiently for Him. The most godly people that I know, when trials and affliction come to them, they don't lose their minds. They don't freak out. I'm jealous of that, actually, because that is my sinful bent, to panic. And I suspect some of you as well, but the most godly people that I know, 
that are examples to me are those that when trials come, their reaction is to stop and pray and say, Lord, whatever you're going to do here, I ask you to do it and sustain me. And they lean on the Lord. That's why, my friends, we need our godly, mature saints who've gone before us. We need those who are seasoned in the faith to be examples and models to us. In a culture that shuns those who are getting older, the church should embrace those who are getting older in the faith and can give us examples for how to go through life. I want to know how to endure trials and hardship. I want to know what it looks like for a saint to lean on Christ when they're afflicted. I need that and so do you. And so this is what this does. It produces in us proven character. In fact, James, the Apostle James, goes a step beyond and he says when we endure trials, we are to rejoice. We are to count it all joy, he says, when you experience various trials. And then he says this, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. Trials test our faith in God, and in time they will produce that proven character. They will produce the endurance as a result of long seasons of endurance that leads ultimately to bulletproof faith and spiritual maturity. You get beaten up, beaten up enough times in the Lord, and you grow through that process, by the end of your life you say, I've, I've seen it all. The Lord has sustained me through, I can't even remember how many trials I've been through in my life, but the Lord's always sustained me. And you praise Him for it. Trials are how God grows and matures Christians. You say, I want to grow, Lord. Get ready. Get ready for trials. Get ready for difficulty. Because that's, what he, that's his method. You've heard of the refiner's fire? Ever heard of that, that reference before? The refiner's fire? It's like a blacksmith who takes an untested piece of metal and jams it into the red-hot flames, rips it out again, takes a hammer, and smashes it to bits, scrapes off the dross, shoves it back in the fire again, heats it up, smashes it again. This process over and over again of destroying and beating up this untested piece of metal. Why does he do it? Because in the end, the goal is to bring this crude piece of metal into a, a place, into a state, where it is strong and pure and now useful. That's what metallurgists do all the time. That's what God does with us. He sticks us in the fire. Like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, he sticks us in the fire, and he pulls us out, and he beats on us, and he scrapes off the dross and puts us back in the fire. But the, Lord, the more that it happens, the more you realize, he's proving me. He's testing me. He's growing me. He's actually making me useful. And then you start to identify with James, and you begin to rejoice. Not that you're in the trial. The trials are horrible by themselves. But when you recognize what God's doing, you say, ah, you're growing me right now. I know it. So Lord, help me to endure this trial because I want to grow. I want to grow. Christians are those who want to grow in godliness. And I'll tell you, God unleashes trials in order to chasten his beloved children and produce in them godly character. But trials are hard. They're painful. And Paul, our friend here, he begged the Lord to relent. He begged the Lord. God, I've been stoned. I've been sick. I've been exiled. I've been jailed. I've been through everything. And Lord, now I have this thorn in the flesh, this messenger of Satan. Lord, please remove this from me. And how does God respond? Look at verse 9. And he has said to me, my grace is is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. The Lord appeals to his own grace at this point. Grace is God's unmerited, unearned favor. It's the loving kindness that God gives us first in salvation. That is the grace of God. But then he gives us grace through the totality of our lives. He gives us grace upon grace upon grace. In fact, John says that Jesus himself is full of grace and truth. That all we ever get from Christ is grace. And as we're going to come to see, understanding God's grace, and we're going to focus on this next week, understanding God's grace is the key to weathering the storms of life. And where oftentimes our bent is to think that God is either somehow cold or absent during the midst of trials. 
we come to see that God is actually very warm and very near and very loving in the midst of trials. He is near to the brokenhearted. He associates with the lowly. Two years ago or so, we went through uh, places in Isaiah, the servant songs of Isaiah, and we read about a place where Christ essentially says, a bruised reed I will not break. A smoking flax, a, a wick that's just barely hanging on, I will not extinguish. He doesn't see a person who's on the very last leg, who's on the, on the brink of destruction. He doesn't see that person and snuff them out. No, God is tender. He's tender with those who are hurting. For those who love Him, for those who are called according to His purpose, He actually will use all these things for good. And in our affliction, He ministers to us in a way that nobody else can. Everything else in the world is lip service. But God actually gives us comfort. He actually gives us His grace. And my friends, if you and I can grapple with this and understand these very basic things, which in the moment feel like they're earth-shattering things, but if we can understand these things, then as we go through trial and pain and difficulty and loss, we won't fall apart. We'll actually grow stronger in the Lord and learn to lean on Him and love Him all the more, even when it hurts. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we know that your disposition toward your beloved is good. That you extend loving kindness to us. And Lord, our, our sinful bent is to become prideful. I certainly know that mine is. To become prideful and think that we're something that we're not. Our bent is to reject your law and reject your grace and reject your gospel. To think that we can do this on our own. Or when we do experience trials, we blame you unjustly for somehow accomplishing sin or wrong or evil against us. But the Bible teaches, and we have come to know that is nothing could be farther from the truth, that you discipline those that you love, that you've poured out blessing on us, the church, that you love us and you sustain us and you lift us up, as the Bible says, on wings like eagles. That you've given us of yourself, that you sent your only beloved begotten Son to give his life, to take our punishment, to endure all the wrath and the pain and the agony of hell. You poured it out on your own Son in love who then died, was buried, and rose victorious, and has now drawn all people to Himself. That in the cross, You extend to us immeasurable grace and kindness. Where even our Lord Jesus says, I have come to give my life as a ransom for many. Lord Jesus, You gave Your life for us. You endured affliction. You were humbled to the point of death, even death on a cross, in order that you would be highly exalted, that you would draw sinners to yourself. And Holy Spirit of God, we know, we know that you do your mightiest work in us in the face of affliction and trial. That you bring all of these verses and all this truth to bear. That you chasten us and you comfort us, and you advocate for us, and you grow us, and you bind the truth of the Word of God to our minds and our hearts, and you convict us of our sin, and you motivate us to repentance, that you're the one who is bringing us closer to Christ, who brings us to God. And so we praise you, our triune God, for the amazing work that you do in us to conform us to the image of the Son. And so, God, I pray that all your people here, in the midst of affliction and trial, in the midst of heartache and pain, that you would do your greatest work in this season of our church, that you would not allow these trials to go wasted in our lives right now, that you would use these things to grow us 
that we might come out the other side more godly, more humble, more dependent on your grace, and more eager to serve you and love you. Have mercy on us, O God. Pour out your grace and blessing. And thank you for all of the grace and blessing that you have given us in Christ. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.